activity show, every live stream virtual visit, we share whatever creative project I'm working on at the time. Today, it's going to be t-shirts. While my pre-recorded audio book, my memoir, Incandescence Rising Above Darkness, we're going to continue story after story. We left off, um, I think, on story uh, chapter 17. They're all short stories. That's the way uh, I like to write, tell stories, um, distillations. So we're going to share four today, and they're all short. And while the audio is being played, I'm going to work on the T-shirts. Monday, uh, my mother's birthday, I had a very fancy silk skirt with 20 stenciled flowers. And today, here's a little seed pod from our maple tree T-shirt, and I'm going to continue with more flowers on t-shirts. This is our latest SVG, which I'm going to do on the first t-shirt. And it's creativity is a superpower. Uh, being connected to our imagination gives us an ability to adjust, problem solve, enhance our lives, heal ourselves, help others. So we can go from like the fancy silk skirt with 20 gold flowers on it to, you know, functional t-shirt and enjoy creating and adjusting and uh, flowing in any creative direction we choose or need to. And stepping into the creative flow, medically documented, increases our happiness, expressing our emotions, stimulates our immune system. So creative expression is a way to do all of that. Writing is a way to be our own sacred witness therapist. Um, doing our own, all the stuff I've shown in these stencil videos, it, it, things that were either given to me, hand-me-downs, or got purchased very, very frugally in, in uh, use stores. So I like to call it fun, fast, frugal. And that's the same way I do home decor, jewelry, uh, dishes, furniture, all of it, florals, all the different creative expressions. And today we're going to start with a, uh, a short video that is kind of an overview of a lot of, not all of, but a lot of the different creative things I've done. Are you ready to show that, Bo? The video that I'm ready to show is the art saved my life. Okay, this uh, is called Art Saved My Life. And as you know from, if you've been here before, Incandescence Rising Above Darkness, I wrote because people asked me to, saying my stories, help them and they'll help others. And it's about using creativity to heal ourselves, enhance our lives and help others. So let's watch this uh, video that Bodhi just very recently put together. I'm so grateful for Bodhi, the movie Claire maker, Cooley's his YouTube prolific channel. And myriad art forms flow effortlessly one into another. Early in life, I found sanctuary in creativity, and I've used it all my life to rise above my own challenges. I love sharing it with others, which is why I wrote Incandescence Rising Above Darkness, my memoir, to help others overcome their difficulties through creative expression. And now, Here's a chapter from my audiobook. Seed settles on sacred soil. Seeds are designed to survive severe cold, extreme heat, drought, and infertile lands until finally the conditions are right to germinate. Some cross oceans or are blown thousands of miles. Some are eaten by animals. Some lie dormant for years until the time is just right to bloom. 
Eventually, the fortunate seeds land on fertile soil and become magnificently what they were meant to be. My mother knew it was necessary for me to stay in the sturdy shape until the time was right for me to blossom safely. My mother understood my tender shoots were too vulnerable and petals too sensitive for this place. We knew there would be a time for me to flower, but until then, we accepted I had to stay contained in the protection of the seed shape, content to survive, waiting for the time to thrive. The winds of chance cast my seed into the gale force of my father's destructive discontent. Staying in the calm eye of the storm of his rage required me to develop an ability to sense the subtle warnings of the violent turbulence brewing. Watching for the smallest changes of the brutal forces around me became a constant vigil. Staying precisely within the serenity of the very middle of the hurricane, within my seed shield, was required. This demanded alertness and agility to be ready to move quickly as the winds shifted. Staying silent to hear early warnings was my discipline. Observing the slightest changes in the environment, my practice, and trusting my instincts, my way. Occasionally, a kind visitor would come to see my mother when my siblings and father were not there. And only then would my mother say, they are very nice, dear. Would you do your seed dance? My mother wanted me to know there were some people who were gentle and among whom I could be safe. I would give my mother a small nod and then go into the other room. My mother would ask the guests to sit on the couch. When they were settled, I would come into the room and walk to the center. Sitting on my feet, I would fold the top of my body over the bottom, then tuck my head and curl my arms along my sides, putting my hands under my feet. After lying motionless in the seat shape for several minutes, I would begin to rise almost imperceptibly. First, my little arms, then torso, then legs would unfold like a sprout reaching for the light. Finally, when my whole body was upright, my arms would reach above my head, my small face would turn toward the sky, I would separate my arms as a flower in full bloom. Without any sound or movement, I would remain there for a few moments, then I would bow toward the guest and leave the room silently. The visitors would be too stunned to utter a sound or applaud before I left the room, but this was as it should be. It was perfect because my seed dance was a gift, not a performance. When the dance was done, the gift had been given. Nothing more needed to happen, and everyone felt complete. You can find Claire Cooley's memoir, Incandescence Rising Above Darkness, on Amazon or anywhere where you buy books. If you'd like to access the audiobook as it is coming out section by section, consider checking out her Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Claire Cooley. This is the essence of everything inspired by the four seasons each season with its primary color, element, metal, and botanical is a connection that we all have with nature and all the elements, earth, water, air, and fire. The essence of everything will be a performance piece where I paint the set, the costumes, spoken word, audio art, and choreography, all interwoven, inspired by nature, my muse. The third floor of the Emerald Lady 
is an apartment for creativity clients who come to have their imaginations inspired and focus on creative projects that give them happiness and purpose. You can get my stencil designs to use for your art projects. There are 10 on my Patreon now and lots more coming. You can buy them for $3 a piece or when you become a member for just $5 a month, you'll get all of them for free. There's no commitment and you can cancel any time. Check it out on patreon.com forward slash Claire Cooley. As a member, you'll get exclusive content and shout outs at the end of my videos like this. If you're not ready to sign up yet, you can become a free member, a great way to support my work and get notifications about my art and book. I put all my live streams on my Patreon for free. Thanks for watching. Until next time, stay creative. Cool. So that was uh, her uh, YouTube channel, The Creativity Show. And we've got some comments here on YouTube. DB Catalyst said, love your work, Claire. Thank you for sharing your multifacetedness. Your multifacetedness. Say that 10 times fast. And then uh, Michael B said on YouTube, mom is loving your memoir. Thank you. Thank you uh, to both of you. And, and thank you, Michael, for sharing my memoir with your mother. That is um, quite the supreme compliment when someone um, shares my art, my book with someone that's precious to them. Um, that is so deeply fulfilling and deeply gratifying. Uh, and like I said, the highest of compliments. So um, every live stream, we're going to share more stories and we're going to do that today uh, as well while I'm doing the painting, which I have to admit, um, I love doing the art and listening to uh, my stories with this distance I've taken from them. Um, and just focusing on the visual art while I'm listening to the words is, is really uh, helps me um, and is so meditative for me. So I'm going to enjoy doing that again today. And I'm going to be doing that every Monday and Thursday live streams at noon central time. So let's start with the first story. Um, Um, and those who may be new joining today, the previous uh, Monday's live stream uh, explained what this story is going to continue. My, my memoir is in chronological order. I think this may be the fourth or fifth live stream I can, um, with the book being read during me doing art. So they're all there on the Creativity Show or on Patreon. Either way, you can get the list and, and follow along. Um, it's a free way for people that can't afford the print version. The book is in color, 68 pieces of art, or black and white, slightly less or an ebook and soon the audiobook will come out but um, I love being able to offer it to people who may not be able to afford one of the ways you can get the book um, they'll get all the audio chapters when they when they come out the reason I have um, put art between every story in my book is because Creative Reverie, the sanctuary of creative expression, is how I got through uh, the adversity in my life and still. So that's what I want to share because it's a superpower we all have. Everyone has an imagination. Yes, I heard the bell. Uh, 
MMM on YouTube. Love your work. Keep up the good work. And Michael B said the artwork in it is beaut is wonderful. Thank you to both of you. I really, really appreciate that. Um, nature is my muse. It is what we're all connected to. It's everybody's home. It's my um, hope that by showing the beauty of nature, it can inspire us to live in ever greater harmony with nature and with each other. So um, that makes me happy when when people uh, appreciate it. And I feel like I'm being a spokesperson for nature and us living in, in harmonious collaboration with nature. We're all connected to it and to each other. So let's start the story. And okay. is this camera, is my art under it? Yes. Um... The story is about to start in a minute, and then I will come out and click 17, record. Seventeen. Life's kindling point. One bolt of lightning can burn an entire forest down. Its destructive capacity can also paradoxically create new life. I felt as if I had been struck by lightning, causing life to reach its kindling and point. And the art is in the right place here. Life igniting from the devastation was as intense as the painful way it happened. Both events changed me. In an instant, I was transformed, immediately initiated into the world of violence. I understood I would be different now, having no explanation of why or how it could happen. I only knew it was terribly wrong that it did. Though I still looked like a child, I was no longer young. Experiencing the cruelty people are capable of altered me forever. The vulgar way it happened did not diminish the sacredness of life beginning within me and the strange duality of the pure and the profane. The wonder of conception was not weakened by the violent way it happened, they were always separate. The hurt, fear, and anger I felt about one did not taint the love and wonder about the other. Accepting the odd duality of life was something I had become accustomed to. People are capable of such valor and malice. I had already seen honor and horror. This was another level that terrified me. I had no explanation for how I was certain I was pregnant and sure it was a son. I did not think this was strange at the time. I felt the unshakable devotion a mother feels for her child that in my inexperience and educational deprivation I had never imagined, wished for, agreed to, or saw coming. None of that mattered. The feeling of loving him came automatically. There was no hesitation in my heart, no debate in my mind, no vacillation in my spirit about doing what I had to do to keep him safe. It was clear what was best for this tiny being understanding now better than I ever had before the assault that I was not safe made it matter of fact for me to accept that the pain of separation had to be endured for my child's well-being. I knew he did not deserve the way he was conceived and that he did deserve to be raised by adults who were capable and ready to be parents. I had to give him the best chance to thrive and selflessly suffer the deep hurt of letting him go. I knew I had to find the strength for him. That is what good mothers do. My only uncertainty was how I was going to survive my grief of letting go. I imagined perishing just after giving birth 
and the thought gave me a sense of relief. I thought it would be a graceful way out of the enormous anguish after our separation. Part of me wanted to birth him healthy and strong and just let go of my own life. I never spoke to my father about what his barroom friend did while he was passed out on the couch in the same room. I did not trust my father, but I did love him. My father had moved out after I suggested that perhaps he could be happy if he did. For a few years after, he would often come over when my mother was working late, like the night the baby-faced monster came over and changed my life on a most profound level and moved out of the state that night. I did not tell my mother because I thought the strain might finally break her. So I carried my secret like I carried the child until my pregnancy started to show and I had to tell my mother. Her response was as always, whatever you want to do, dear. She trusted the way I made decisions only when my heart and mind agreed. I had made up my mind minutes after the assault, and I did not ever change it. She respected and honored my choices and never lectured or doubted me. When my father noticed I was pregnant in my eighth month, he pretended I had had an affair and said, I guessed we should have gotten you some of those little white pills. I did not dignify his comment with an answer or even a glance. Years later, the daughter of my father's second wife told me what she had not yet told anyone else in the family. During the time I was raped, my father had been raping her for several years since she was seven. Her sharing this horror with me gave me the confidence to share my distrust of my father with her. I told her I had a haunting suspicion the baby-faced monster had received my father's permission to rape me. She told me then that she had overheard a conversation between them in which my father said, what Claire needs is a good fucking. I understood that what I intuited years earlier, that my father felt the need to break my spirit, to control me, was accurate. He feared anyone he could not control. He controlled my siblings through insults, threats, and violence. But because of my mother and my desire to emulate her, he could not make me hate him or myself. That terrified him and was the reason he let his friend rape me. I believe they thought they would own me if I got pregnant. They understood rape has the power to destroy a person's sense of self-worth, but it could not destroy mine because I refused to let hate stay in my heart. My mother gave me the gift of understanding that my heart was meant to be full of love so I found a way to forgive them both, and I found the strength to only love and protect the innocent being within me. I told him many times a day while carrying him, I love you, and I have sent that message ever since. Leaving the hospital without him was excruciating, but I had no doubt I was doing what was right. Giving him the best chance gave me incredible strength. My father came to give me a ride home from the hospital without my knowledge or permission. I think he hoped I would be broken and finally he could control me. He studied me as we rode down the elevator with a couple and their new infant. I focused all my attention on the mother with her newborn infant across from me. We were eye level in the wheelchairs the hospital required us to leave in. She looked at me with such loving softness, and I felt she understood everything. Giving birth had opened her heart to understand without speaking a word. As we smiled at each other, my father almost lost his composure. For once, I knew what he was feeling. He was terrified. He stared at me, probably thinking, how can she not be crushed? 
How can she smile at a woman leaving with her baby while she is leaving without her own? He had no way of understanding how I could be at peace. He couldn't understand the love involved in sacrificing for what is best for one's child. The way my father looked at me changed from that moment on. I do not know if it was out of respect or fear. Perhaps my father could only respect what he feared. Maybe it was his shame in setting me up to be raped. He could not imagine how I could be at peace. How could I not crumble? He could not fathom how someone who refused to hate could not be broken by someone else's hate. I followed love while he ran away from it. Our paths did not cross or run parallel, even while we were right next to each other. He was in anguish about his actions. I was at peace with mine. I had learned to be comfortable with the paradox of the fact that some go through similar experiences and end up hating, while some end up loving. I focused on my courage to do what was most loving for my son, not the brutal way that life reached its kindling point inside of me. That's, uh, I have to acknowledge, that's a very powerful story to hear. And as those of you can see, um, I am at peace and people go through terrible things they didn't deserve. Innocent people that did nothing to bring it on to themselves, nothing to deserve it can have, uh, you know, good people have bad things happen to them. It, it happens all the time. And part of the reason I tell my stories is there's a lot of confusion in the world. Shaming victims is very popular, especially blaming women for whatever happens to them. I've heard terrible things, um, even from people I thought professed they cared about me. Um, and some of them are actually harder to forgive than my father or the rapist because they appeared so broken by what happened to them. It was easier for me to access compassion for them, but people who say terrible things to victims, blaming them, in my opinion, out of their own fear that they none of us are in control of others and there's so much in life that can happen that's beyond our control our attitude and our actions are the only things we get to control so um people are too afraid to admit that they want to believe that they're safe or their loved ones are safe and it wouldn't happen to them or the people they care about but the truth is that perfectly innocent people who weren't drunk or in a dangerous place or doing anything uh, foolish can be victims. And that's part of the reason I share my stories without shame and that we can heal whatever we set out to. Uh, it's not easy. Sometimes it's very difficult and I had to tell my stories to the sacred few in my inner circle and then write them and sometimes a few times and then give them away uh, to heal but i have healed those things there are other things i'm still working on because i'm an imperfect human and i do have some hurt and resentments i still need to work through and i'll share those when and if it's appropriate after i've healed it but we can heal anything we set out to, and we can find people that can help us. And those who would blame us for being victims, they cannot help us. As one of those people said to me that I had a Jesus complex, and I said to her, no, I have a Buddhitude. And Buddha said, I can't help you because you're confused. 
and anyone who blames victims is confused and we can't help everyone. We can only help those who are open to it and help ourselves heal. And we have to accept that some people are attached to their wounds and we cannot help them. That's confusion. So that's enough of that. Is there any comments? Uh, if we have questions, the questions that come in, I'll answer after the stories. So are there any comments? Yes, there are. So we've got LG91 uh, on YouTube. Hi, Claire. So lovely to relax while watching your art become realized. I am having trouble. I'm hearing an echo, so I had trouble understanding that comment. Okay. Uh, hi, Claire. So lovely to relax while watching your art become realized. Thank you. I agree. I love to relax into creative discovery. I think this uh, calla lily turned out really sweet. I'm very happy with it. And, uh, and now we're going to do a rose hotter. The three more comments. Sure. MMM on YouTube had two comments. Difficult stories with important messages makes for beautiful literary art. Thank you so much for sharing. You certainly have a magical way with words. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to say that we all have a voice and my mother helped me become comfortable with mine and I feel very blessed for that. But I also know that even if it's not within our own family or teachers or coaches or friends, there's someone for everyone that can help us find our own voice and our own voice is the most powerful tool we have to share with others, which is another, and to help the world, which is another reason I'm doing these live streams and doing them at this mature age where many women have stopped speaking up. Some women never start speaking up and most of them stop, um, you know, when Hollywood tells them no one wants to hear from or see a woman over 40 or whatever arbitrary uh maybe because young women are easier to control young flesh is more attractive but we're so much more than physical we are we are mental spiritual emotional we have so much more to give than to just be sexy and if we're not sexy anymore take care of kids and if we're past those years, we're just supposed to be snarky. Well, I've never followed any of those rules. Be who you are, speak up, especially mature women, because you have more to say. So that's that. All right. Also, you, your stencil art really transcends the idea of stencils to museum level creations. Wow. Thank you so, so much. Um, yes, I love to distill nature and whether it's birds or flowers or fish or grasses, whatever it is, I like to distill the lines into their essence um, and be inspired, my muse nature, to communicate the beauty, the form, in as few lines as possible so it really lends to stenciling and and the reason i'm doing all these stencils is because i think it's a way to help people get into their creative expression because they can get the stencils if they're not comfortable to make their own yet and they can start in, in making art to wear or home decor or on hats whatever they'd like to do with them and it's a way that I can help other people begin to step into the happiness of their creative flow. So that's why I did 300 stencil designs and, 
And this one is the latest one that just came out today on Patreon, this Calla Lily. So the Patreon members um, get all of them for no additional cost. Their $5 a month membership, they get everyone. And I'm going to try to put out two a week, uh, a new one for every live stream until all 300 are out. And probably by the time I get close to 300, I'll have done a bunch more. Um, so they're just going to keep coming. So uh, I love that. All right. And DB Catalyst on YouTube said the leftover paint on the stencil plastic looks really cool. Those are art pieces as well. You should frame your used stencils. Ha ha. Well, that's a beautiful idea. Um, I keep using them, even though they have the paint on them. Um, I keep using them. Sometimes I soak them in hot water so that the paint doesn't constrict the spaces so that the paint can still flow through the cuts in the stencils. But some of these stencils I've literally been using since Bodhi was a baby. And so they last as long as you take care of them. Um, but I, I like that idea, maybe photographing them as they keep changing. Cause when I add a new color, they change. So making the photographs into art so I can keep using the stencils and keep them as stencils. That's a fabulous idea. And I really appreciate it when, when you guys give me ideas like Michael last week, used them for decorating cakes. I never thought of that. And I didn't think of what you just suggested. So thank you very, very much. All right. So shall we start the next story? Okay, and now I'm going to do the rose. Story number 18, Playing with Paradox. One of my parents was a creature of gigantic gentleness, like a blue whale. The other a creature of unpredictable ferocity, like a lion. The improbable combination of such different beings as my parents was only the first conundrum in my life. The spark of my particular life landed in the womb of an exceptionally kind person, but I was still not safe there. My mother's selfless consideration could not protect me from my father's selfish shame turned to violence. I always felt safe with one parent, and I could never let my guard down with the other. There was so much paradox in the life I was born into, so to be at peace with it, it had to become my playmate. My father wanted to name me Roxanne, but uncharacteristically, my mother insisted that my name was Clara. When I asked her why she was certain of my name, she answered emphatically, without hesitation or explanation, that was your name. Claire means clear and bright. Roxanne means bright and radiant one. Both of my parents chose names that sound totally different, but have the same meaning. How did they both choose a name that meant bright? My mother chose the name that also meant clear. How did she know that was my name? Did she know who I would be before I was born? Or did her naming me create who I became? Am I trying to live up to her belief in me? Or did her belief in me guide my journey here? Some of the most interesting questions may never have answers, but that does not mean we should not ask them and keep seeking answers. It does mean we should find a way not to be tormented by the conclusions we may never have. Living with paradox is part of life. My mother's upbringing made her remarkably enlightened and humble. My mother was born in rural Massachusetts to a hard-working Irish Catholic mother and an abusive alcoholic father. 
She was told her severe asthma was caused by inhaling baby powder as an infant that someone left near her crib. The doctor suggested she would do better in the city, so she was separated from her mother and siblings and sent to live with her unmarried aunt in Boston. My mother's health often kept her from attending school. She loved learning and read voraciously. Her aunt had to work most of the time to support them, so my mother had to often endure severe asthma attacks alone. I believe this had a powerful influence on her spiritual enlightenment. Perhaps the adversity allowed her to acquire an acceptance most never reached. She came to understand we are in control of only how we handle what happens to us, not what happens to us. She reached a light-hearted spiritual wisdom. I never saw her lose her patience with anyone, except once when a boyfriend accused me of being promiscuous, and a different man once said my mother did not love me. Both times she showed that she did indeed feel righteous indignation when it was called for. Even then, she did not say anything unkind. She simply cleared up their confusion and her unequivocal support of my honor. My mother was always honest and open with me about her thoughts, feelings, and history. On the other hand, my father never spoke of his family or upbringing. I knew very little about his childhood, except he lied about his age to join the Navy when he was 17. He contracted tuberculosis in the Second World War and was sent back to his hometown, where he lost a lung. After he left the hospital and his hometown, he went to San Diego to convalesce. He never mentioned that his mother came to help him recover. I found this out through my cousin sharing a newspaper article. My father did not return to his hometown until he went back with my brother who wanted to see where he grew up. They arrived unannounced the day after Leon Sr. died, more than 20 years later. My father did not speak of his brothers, sister, or father. He only ever mentioned his mother. My father was either feverishly pursuing a new endeavor, raging or morose. He was always the center of attention whenever people were around. His quick wit, storytelling, and no allegiance to truth made him very entertaining. He was charismatic and needed to always control the conversation and circumstances by any means necessary. Certainly, he was very funny and interesting, but I was always waiting for the devastating insult about anyone who challenged or threatened him. I did not enjoy his gift of gab as strangers did. He was compelled to dominate every gathering, not because he enjoyed doing so, but out of some dark need to control. I observed that fearful people need to control while loving people want to support. My mother wanted everyone to be heard. My father wanted everyone to hear him. I developed a shield of silence so he could not figure out what mattered to me and demean it as he did to my siblings. My survival technique worked to spare me his cruel insults. So instead of demeaning me, he isolated me by saying I was his favorite. I did not blame them for resenting me for being spared his denigrations. This foiled his plan to get me to be angry even though they were cruel at times. Once my brother held a pillow over my face until I stayed so motionless that he feared he had killed me. Another time he decided to see if the car cigarette lighter's red coils were actually hot by pressing it against my uncovered arm. My younger sister once snuck up behind me while I was writing and hit me in the back of the head with a solid glazed ball of rock-hard clay. It hurt so bad I was afraid I might strike someone for the first time. 
I yelled to her, lock yourself in the bathroom and do not let me in, and then I gave her a head start. Once my older sister woke me up in the middle of the night when she was on speed and pinned my shoulders to the bed, holding a needle in her shaking hands to pierce my ears. I had the presence of mind to stay still so she would not pierce my cheek instead. They took on some of my father's anguish. I did not blame them for not figuring out how to stay out of the line of fire of his fury. Only my mother did not take on his pain. I chose to follow her path. I came to see the paradox that the one who appeared to be strong was really the weak one, and the one who appeared weak was really the strong one. Okay. Yes, I, I want to say that uh, hearing that, um, I have no resentments toward my siblings who um, I feel compassion that they maybe thought, as it's called Stockholm Syndrome, that the, the loud, aggressive one uh, was the one to follow my father and that my mother, who was gentle and soft-spoken, um, maybe was the weak one, that that happens in our world. People, I think, both out of confusion that they think the bully or the aggressive one is the strong one, um, and sometimes it's fear that they'll be abused or bullied if they don't comply with the with the aggressive one. So I feel compassion for them. I don't feel any resentment. Um, I do wish and hope that someday they will see the, the true strength of the loving kindness my mother was and follow that and champion that. I do hope so. Yes, did you ring? We, you got two uh, comments, one on YouTube, one on Facebook. Uh, YouTube, DB Catalyst, very satisfying storytelling, thanks. And uh, Sumner Madison on Facebook, your words and works are transformative for all ages. Need to have more people across the region and nation be introduced to you. But but a kind uh, acknowledgement that is um i i do acknowledge that i want to help as many people as possible that's why i faced my shyness my fear of speaking up and being out there and writing my truth um it's so my desire to help people is greater than my own insecurities um, but it is not easy to speak up as uh, a person, especially as a woman, especially, especially as a woman of uh, mature age, especially, especially because you can't tell many people have guessed my um, heritage incorrectly all of my life. So I guess I'm, I don't quite fit in a box and my strange upgrade bringing without academic background, training, education, uh, choosing not to watch TV, read books, but observe nature for my teacher, my education um, is different. And so people often fear what's different. And we're in a live in a world that's ageist, sexist, elitist, racist. So I've had to face all that to speak up. And I am, well, I'm pleased I have, and I love helping people. It's greater than my fears of my own privacy. I am a friendly recluse. I am always thinking about what makes people happy in my much solitude in my life. Um, so I appreciate it if you share it with others. 
I'll never be good at self-promoting. I don't know how it doesn't come naturally. Um, so it restores my faith in humanity that people want to help each other. And um, so you can help me help others by sharing it. So thank you, all of you. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, my braid's rubbing on the microphone. Okay. So we'll do one more story and then we'll call it a day. Okay. Nineteen, the clairvoyant dance contestant. The train clicked down the track with a constant rhythm for my first trip alone away from home. Before this, I was shackled by the judgments of those who knew or heard of my father or older sister. Their boisterous anger preceded me everywhere I went. I was his daughter or her sister but now I was free of that association for the first time. No one knew them before they met me. My possibilities were as open as the landscape out the train windows. Finally, now that I could be anyone I wanted to be, who did I want to be? Did I want to be a famous surgeon's daughter or from royalty or diplomats or the daughter of a well-known artist? or a Nobel Peace Prize recipient, or a chess champion, or a world-renowned violinist. Maybe I should be an orphan, or a descendant of a silent picture star, or a president, or an Indian chief. Of all the lives I considered, the only one I was intrigued by for more than a moment was being an orphan in search of her true identity. But who I really wanted to be was simply me. I could be me without anyone knowing any shocking details of my life, like how sheltered I was from other people or ordinary situations. No one would know that I had my first friends and conversations recently, or that my father's barroom buddy raped me while my father was passed out in the same room. It would be my secret that I was afraid of everyone who was bigger than me, men because of their lust, women because of their jealousy. I was exhilarated by the idea that people would have no information, preconceived notions or prejudices, that for the first time I would be seen for who I was. The train made a stop at a tiny town in the middle of the night. A petite woman got on with a sleeping baby in her arms and two small children holding on to her skirt. She surveyed the car and came over to the seat next to me. I could see she was frightened and exhausted. In one look and a nod, we both understood she was escaping danger. As the train rolled down the track, we spoke of many things, but we never spoke of what or who she was getting away from. Just before dawn, she said, "'Promise me you will never marry a man you cannot talk to.'" Yes, I promise. These words gave her comfort and peace, and finally she fell asleep and looked like an angel in the dawn light. When we pulled into Albuquerque, she and her three children were all still sleeping. I wanted to stay and watch over them. A tear came to my eye knowing I could not. My struggle was my struggle, and her struggle was her struggle. I felt that our meeting helped us both, and that was enough. She was small but strong, I was young but brave. We would both be okay, but it was hard to leave her on the train. I said a prayer for their protection, and I got off the train. My friend Janice was waiting at the station and excited to see me. What's wrong, she said, seeing my sadness. I did not want to speak of it, so I replied, I'm just exhausted. I'll be okay. Later that night, Janice and I went to the movies. While in line, 
I asked Janice, who loved talking about boys. Of all the boys you know, who would you like to see again? She described a boy she had not seen in two years. I wasn't really following her fast talking and too many details. A few minutes later, she screamed as the boy she spoke about walked up. Later that night, I heard her say to him, my friend Claire knew you were coming. She has psychic powers. The next night, we went to hear live music in a dance hall. On the way home, she said, what about the guitar player? He seemed to really like you. Do you like him? He is nice, I said, but do you like him? Not like that, and he has a girlfriend. Did he tell you? No, but you can tell. You can tell because you're psychic. Anybody could tell, and I wish you would not say I'm psychic anymore, especially in front of other people. Why? You should be proud of it. The next night we went back to the dance hall, and the guitar player came over to me nervously and stumbled with his words, not able to get them out. I said, it's okay that you have a girlfriend. I just want to be friends. Who told you, he shouted. Nobody told me. Then how did you know? You can just tell, I said. Oh yeah, the lead singer told you, didn't he? He is always trying to ruin things for me. He was angry and threatening the lead singer, so I said, Janice, what did I tell you last night on the way home when the lead singer could not have told me anything? Claire said you had a girlfriend. I said to the guitar player, See, you know I did not talk to the singer last night, so he could not have told me. Janice said, Claire knows things. She is psychic. Stop it, I said to Janice, but it was too late. The guitar player said, Okay, if you're psychic, tell me about the other band members' love lives. I thought I would say a bunch of incorrect, specific stuff, and they would both leave me alone. So I said, the lead singer is always talking about his conquests, but he's really never been with a girl. The piano player has been with the same girlfriend since junior high, and she just had surgery. He is very worried, but she is going to be fine. I was just about to speak about the drummer when I looked at the guitar player's face. He looked at me like he'd seen a ghost. Then I looked at Janice, and she also looked frightened. Without wanting to, I was right about the two guys. I could see that Janice thought I could see her secrets too, and she was afraid of me now. Janice and I never spoke of it again, nor did she speak freely with me again. I decided then and there not to ever do that again as no good could come from it. The next night at the dance hall, there was a dance contest with a cash prize. I needed the money to get home. I did not tell anyone that I knew I would win. I laughed inside when the music started and they chose Black Magic Woman for the contest. I used the money to buy a train ticket home. I was relieved to be going home to my mother who was not afraid of anything I could see. She always knew things that she could not explain. She trusted the mysterious information and only used it to help others. She was comfortable with the unknown origins of what seemed to be psychic to others, but was normal to us. When I told her I knew I would win the dance contest, which I only entered to get the money to come home, she laughed and said, that makes sense because you are the clairvoyant dance contestant. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, go ahead. You have a comment or question? A few comments. We've got YouTube. DB Catalyst said, very satisfying storytelling. Thanks. And thanks for your stories and art. Thank you for hearing me and uh, appreciating what I, I want to share with others because it helps me and you know doing what we love and giving it to the world is the best we have to share so thank and you moving for movie makers on youtube said gotta go thanks for the stream great work thank you appreciate you being here okay 
I think uh, I think we'll wrap up for today. Is it getting okay? How's this? All right. So I think we'll wrap up for today. We got an iris, a rose. Calla lilies, and this is the SVG that came out today, and these uh, are already out, and there'll be another one on Monday um, that will come out, and another live stream Monday at noon, Mondays and Thursdays at noon. So thank you so much for being here and commenting, questions um suggestions likes all of that subscribing really appreciate it and uh, sharing it with friends thank you very much and see you monday meanwhile stay creative